starting whoever, to say. Whoever talk. can brief me is fine. And go ahead, Brett. Is this being recorded? It's supposed to be. I think it should be, right? Okay. Yes. So whoever misses can follow up on this. Okay, good. So Misha's connecting audio. That's probably good. So we don't have to worry about all the other stuff. So Misha, can you just, I can know. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Ooh. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't worry. Just, I just walk me through five minutes. Walk me through what you guys are up to. Um, can you? Yeah, I saw you for a minute there. How about now? Oh. I can see you. There you yep, go. There you go. Okay. Ooh. Don't worry. Don't. We don't need stress. This is just you're just talking to the old professor. It's all you're doing. No big deal. Can you see my screen, sir? I can. I can see your screen. Um, I wanted there to share is. this with you. Can you see this? Do I you can. see a stick figure that's waving? I can. Okay. Hello. Hello. My name is My name is Nimisha Shah. I spent the vast majority of my life complacent with the status quo, but with the help of my support group, Innovators Anonymous Team 3, I have been innovating for 14 days, 7 hours and 2 minutes. We started this journey by reading a lot of news, something we call weather watching. We're trying to make sense of the events we've seen. I'm not so sure that we understand exactly. But something that we did notice that caught everyone's eye is the F-35s. The parts, the construction, um, the acquisition, the entire process pertaining to the F-35s seems to be daunting and seems to be presenting a supply chain issue. I want you to imagine a critical Air Force mission in the Indo-Pacific region where time is of the essence in 2018 this happened. During a high intensity operation, an F-35 squadron faced a significant delay because a vital component for the jet's navigation system was held up in the supply chain. This delay caused by inefficiencies and bureaucratic hurdles grounded the jets for several days comprising the mission's success and putting national security at risk. The real world scenario highlights the urgent need for a streamlined effective supply chain system in contested environments. So our HQT, is to util utilize advanced software programs to enhance supply chain utilization in the Indo-PACOM theater within the next year. We've been, we have always tried to do less with more, but we would like to focus on effectiveness rather than efficiency. The current paradigm of efficiency isn't working. We aim to break existing norms and set a new standard in logistics. As Peter Drucker famously noted, efficiency is doing things right. Effic effectiveness is doing the right things. It's high time we start doing the right things. We're, strate we're strate strategically positioning our effort with DLA and other key constituents to enable these organizations to avoid substantial costs associated with inefficiencies and improve overall operational readiness. What we need to move forward. We need funding to develop and deploy our software solution. We need support in identifying blind spots in current systems, as well as communication gaps that may exist. And we need to collaborate with logistics experts, specifically to ensure that our solution is both practical and impactful. We're hoping to address pressing questions, so the visibility of costs, um, this notion that our solution will provide visibility into the tangible costs um, as opposed to what we think of when we think of opportunity costs. We would like to run some experiments with guidance um, and we're hoping to again, balance efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, Dr. DeGraff, please help us. Well, thank you for that. Okay, you could take the screen off now. so I can see your faces. So the first, the first just to note, not that it's irrelevant, but uh, I had a very long conversation with Ken Wilspach right after this happened. I was at Hickam for the discussion, right? And um, it's it's a it's an enormous issue everywhere. Um, a couple thoughts before we get too far down the road here on this. <clears throat> um, I'm hearing three different problems here right 
the first problem I'm hearing is just a problem of logistics, which software solves, right? But I would like to ask you a question, Misha, about that. If, in fact, a commanding officer saw this as a mission existential crisis, and it was simply a software issue, wouldn't it have been resolved already? Meaning, it's you get where I'm going with this. It's not a software issue. If it was a software issue, that would be a leaning on somebody and it'd be a purchase order and that'd be the end of it. So it's not. So step one is whatever we think this problem is, it's really probably not the problem. Right? Even though I don't have any, I don't have any inside baseball on this, but I suspect it's not. I'm work, I'm also a tech. Well, like a after you, ma'am. So it might be something like a manufacturing issue. Is that what you're implying? Well, it could be. Oh, oh, yeah. We're, you, don't don't jump ahead. You're Sorry. Ahead. <laughs> Always the A student who sits in front and tries to jump ahead. Now, hold on. Just hold on. <clears throat> We're going to get there together. So the first issue is, this doesn't look like a logistics issue to me. The second issue then becomes, well, then what kind of an issue is it? Right? So Misha gave us one example. It could be supply chain issue itself, which wouldn't surprise me, but I'm not sure anything we can do with this group would solve that problem. So for example, I'm going to tell you two things that bother me that have nothing to do with you. Number one, the company that primarily makes this aircraft is buying back their stock. Now, what that tells you if you're a business professor is they think more of buying back their stock than investing in their country, right? Um, when Intel did that to Apple, you, everybody know what Apple did? Apple started building their own chip, cut them, bled them out, and Intel's in real trouble. The fact that a, the fact that you'd let a prime do that, which none of, we're not gonna be able to fix that, is to me inexcusable. Right. This is where I think I'd, I'd be much nastier in a senior role, but you can't be because they're the only ones who do this. And two, they're trying to build their part system on a rope. I was at the AFA when they announced this whole thing, which sounds like great to everyone because they can make the part faster. What it basically means is you have no way to redress this issue. <clears throat> there's no way around that issue. So there's not much you can do about being locked in. Is this making sense? So I'm I'm not trying to make this difficult for you. I'm trying to tell you what looks like dead ends to me, right? Yes, it should. Yes, it is a supply chain issue partially, but do we have the means to correct that? No, that's a contractual issue. That's an issue that, you know, the RCO has to deal with. That's not anything anybody here can deal with. Now, I'm not saying this is a dead end because it's not. Now, what's the next step? If that if that you can't get that part, what's the next step? Now, can we think creatively for a minute together? Is that okay? Because up to this point, Misha, this looks like project management to me. This doesn't look like innovation. This looks like, you know, pounding a nail on a board. You know, we we got to pound a nail on the board. No, okay. I hope I'm not offending. I'm just, and incidentally, ambiguity to all of you. I know, Misha, I can see you reeling from this. Tolerance of ambiguity is, is a very difficult thing to deal with. My MBAs have so much trouble with this. And I'm, I have to tell you, I'm so much nicer with the Air Force than I am with them. Because the first half of the semester, I just basically destroy them. <laughs> and then the second half, I rebuild them. <laughs> so, they're, so we send them out in the world. So they can screw up the market and make a billion dollars and whatever MBAs do these days. <laughs> um, now I need you to think about a couple of things. Number one, if we were to get leverage on any of this, how would we do this? We certainly wouldn't do this in terms of supply chain. It would do something that you you glazed over so you clearly understood it, but you didn't put a pin in it. And that is, that the mission cannot be accomplished, that this is a mission ending problem. So 
in a sense, why we usually try and make a sense of destiny positive, you need to be creating a sense of distress or understanding the distress. Now, I'll tell you the same thing I've told every group here. No one cares about your innovation. They don't care about mine either. They care about you solving their problem. And I can tell you what, what because of what happened in 18, Ken Wilsbach knows he has a problem, right? And he's got, when I talked to him, he had two, two stars working on this, <clears throat> right? So this is a real, this is real. So you need to, to connect this problem to the mission and you need to connect it to a person who will fail at the mission if this doesn't succeed. And you need to stop talking about your innovation and start talking about you're helping them solve their problem. So everybody understand the first piece. I haven't changed anything substantively what you've done, Misha. I've simply turned the discussion in a different direction. Everybody follow step one, right? People don't resist people who have solutions to their problems. Now, where we need to have some real creativity here is one of three buckets. Number one, what agency does our sponsor actually have to redressing this issue in the supply chain? Meaning what capability do they really have? Who do they, who can they pressure? Is there a special document? Is there, because, you know, think about RapidX. Is there a second pathway that could be gone down here? There always is. What is it? So you need to get an acquisition officer in here. You need to understand what routes are available. In a sense, you need to use the system against itself. There's always a place in the system that's a shoots and ladders place. And the Air Force is filled with them. Well, what happened was we had a whole bunch of people in real time who did not plan on this happening. And it happened, and they didn't know how to do this in real time. They didn't know how to get that part in real time. Step two, step two, the second part to this. The most important thing in any supply chain is to be predictive. I would write this word down and tattoo it somewhere. Predictive. Supply chains are supposed to be predictive. You're supposed to have that part at this place at this time. And there's supposed to be fail-safe parts to those systems. So don't get me wrong. If your Christmas present arrives a day behind Christmas, that's one thing. But if you're doing heart transplant surgery and it arrives three hours past when it's supposed to arrive, the patient dies and it doesn't work. So anytime you see a logistic system, they're predictive. And the more they're real-time, the more they're fail-safe systems behind them. Now, if in fact somebody was without a key part, that tells me two things. That tells me, one, you didn't simulate that this could happen. You did not expect it. And two, it tells me you didn't have any fail-safe systems in place in case this happened. And particularly for parts on airplanes, given what goes on with additive manufacturing or real-time manufacturing, or part, you know, uh, additive manufacturing, meaning you've got a basic part, but you can job it out in a, on an island somewhere to finish what the part needs to be. You know, these are things that are doable, right? These are things that are very doable, right? You have to make sure that, again, the way it's set up right now, there's a legal issue here, but there's also a technical issue here. You can solve the technical issue. Don't try and solve the legal issue. That's what you need power to do. I want to make sure I'm being clear about these steps. So the predictive thing is, could you run a simulation? Or could you look at, not run it, could you look at the simulations people are running? And could you predict with some accuracy where you think that's going to fail? You know who does this better than anybody? Is General Electric. They make a fortune doing this, or they used to. Now, of course, they sold the, their uh, engine division. But in Cincinnati or down the road from AFRL, this would, should not be hard to find out. Somebody at AFRL, I'm sure, knows how to do this. 
So what General Electric made a ton of money on, just in case you don't know this, is they made turbines, H drives, all these different turbines. Well, the challenge with that is that if you're an airline, Every day your aircraft, your Boeing aircraft is out of service. It's something like $4.5 million. <clears throat> well, me paying for your data on how often my engine ought to be reviewed and the statistical probability of it going out of service is worth the $200,000 a month I'm paying you to predict when my engines are going to fail and when I have to bring that aircraft in. Is this making sense to you? So Boeing not, I mean, so General Electric not only made money selling the engine, they made money predicting when the engine was going to fail because it's a fail-safe industry, right? And incidentally, wouldn't it be great if Boeing had the same kind of, you know, fail-safe things in place as General Electric did? <laughs> we They wouldn't be where they're at right now. So the second piece, I want to make sure I'm being clear about this, is can you can you look at the simulations and predict where things are likely to fall out. This is really important. I did a big project around this very ish, kind of issue with supply chain, with looking at where the Chinese were likely to intervene in the supply chain. So there, there are ways of statistically looking at this data. Again, what you need in order to do this is somebody who's an expert and looking at statistical probabilities and looking at the simulations that you're running. And remember, we're tying it back to the mission and the person who owns that. If you don't do that, this will not get off the ground. And I wanna add something to this, Misha. This is actually one of the most important things anybody can be working on. So I love this innovation. And I know it looks, starts to look like project management, but it is only in as much as you're trying to, to solve the existing system. Now that we're trying to think beyond the existing system, we're into real innovation now, <clears throat> right? This is a perfect use of artificial intelligence. I can almost guarantee if you could find a decent university where you're at that has some large, you know, it has a generative AI capability. Where are you at, Misha? Where are you located? New Jersey. Well, you ought to be, that ought to be great. There's, you know, Princeton is there, you know, which has a great AI lab, right? So, so I would basically see if I could get, if I could poach a postdoc, they'll love this because it'll open up research opportunities from whatever, just post, it doesn't mean you have to get them too far in, but just say, how would we run this simulation? Can I get a day of your time? What would it take? That sort of, thing, right? A lot of smart people run around that part of New Jersey good to know right um the third piece what would be amazing is uh, uh, is there a way in the simulation to do one of two things one is there a way to to substitute something for the part or i guess in general the f-35 could a drone swarm be used, you know, not permanently for a period of time? Could this whole, could this be used for a day? Right. The second thing would be, could could there be a way to provide real data to adjust the warfighter plan? So it's sort think of it like a football game where, you know, um, University of Michigan has this incredible halfback named Blake Corum. And right before we played Ohio State, he got a cheap shot against Illinois and he blew out his ACL. Well, there has to be a game plan then that has to be adjusted because the guy who's scoring all your touchdowns is hurt. And a lot of times this happens in the game at real time and you have to have a plan B, if you will, but you have to have a way of knowing that he's going to get hurt. Is this making sense to everybody? You have to have a way of knowing that you have to adjust your play your play here. So if I'm a general and I have to adjust my war fighting plane, plan, the more I can get in front of this, the better off I'm going to be. So to me, what you're talking about here has kind of these two struts to it. The one strut is actually creating an alternative 
way to source to sort to track and source parts which i'm saying i think there's limited ability to do that right if i'm being realistic but the second is there is there a way to predict and to inform and to decide predict inform and decide that there might be a problem getting a general in front of it and then i think there's a high degree of capability there and probably a high interest or a high marginal utility for sure if i'm a senior leader in that area because you're taking something that's normally hidden from a senior commander, just like a CEO would be, and you're making it very transparent, which I think is actually really interesting. Okay, I wanna stop there and take, because I don't wanna drive you down this road. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think out loud with you and I could be way off here. I just need to really warn you. But I have a pretty good sense of where this, again, you can see I'm very biased about your supply chain. I don't think I'm telling anybody here anything that you don't know. The fact that you're, you're in this conundrum, you're, you're being, you're, I feel very bad for the military. I think in some ways you've been handcuffed and we're not doing the kind of job we should be doing to support you, right? From the business side, we're just not getting it done. And I think rather than having more freedom to substitute, you're going to have less given what the primes are doing. You know, I'm watching, I'm reading the paper and I'm watching what people are doing. And, and this is, of course, not so much what's going on in the military. This is, this is our representatives who are letting this happen because it's about we're going to manufacture this part of the F-15 in your state, right? I mean, this is what this has come down to, unfortunately, regrettably. <clears throat> but the transparency of what's likely to be there when you need it and what's likely to not be there would be interesting. So Misha, let me come back and give this a very real tangible example. I would say, let's take, and so don't boil the ocean. I would pick one aircraft, let's pick the F-35 and I'd pick five parts. I'd look at the supply chain of five parts. It would be relatively easy to enter data into an artificial intelligence generative engine. You could do this on chat if you wanted to. I would say, here's what they're, what the deliverables are from these five vendors on these five parts. And here is an actual reconciliation from the Air Force or from the Space Force or whatever division you're in of when that part was delivered and what price it was delivered at. What that's going to give you is a confidence interval. How likely is that to land, right? Then what I would do is I would look at these and I'd say, when planning war fighting, just like your consumer report, black dot, red dot, I would do that with this, these parts. I would say a part that comes from producer A gets a black dot. And the reason they get a black dot is their delivery times are 38% off when they say they are. Right. And this is not you. They're not going to give you this data. This is the data that comes from your your acquisition community, what the contract says and when it was delivered. So not the crap that's in the contract, what they not what the vendor says, what you guys say. <clears throat> right. And then I would say, so now on an F-35 on these five key parts, here's the confidence interval that this uh, for this and what that means to you general so and so is that you know this f-35 cumulatively has a confidence interval of such and such right now if i was really trying to be incredible here which is which is really not so much what you're supposed to be doing in this project because it's now reeling over into project management so let me make sure i'm being clear about this the innovation here is the consumer, yeah, does everybody know what consumer reports is? Whether your car gets a black dot or a red dot, that's an innovation. So a leader looks at this and goes, oh, on the F-35 supply chain, tier one, these are the red dots, these are the black dots, tier two, you know, a couple of tier twos, that's gonna be pretty exciting to a senior leader. That's an innovation. But if I really wanted to look at this, I would look at, what is the failure rate, which I'm sure you already have this data <clears throat> on any of these parts, going back to the General Electric discussion. So you see what I'm doing here, Misha, it's tic-tac-toe. I'm saying on one hand, 
there's a technical issue how often this part fails. On the other hand, there's a supply chain issue on how often this supplier is able to get this to you at time and cost and cost. Because I'm sure the stuff that they make in real time and they have to ship out overnight, I'm sure it's 400% markup. I'm sure it's insane. Does this make sense? And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid all that and saying that's your job supplier to be in front of this thing. I hope I'm making sense here. So I'm trying to make this argument for you of saying, I think the thing you're working on is absolutely dynamite. I think it's really good supply chain, the Pacific, you're checking all the boxes. You know, your, your lead aircraft, you're checking all the boxes. Who's going to be interested? Anybody who's in PACAF, who's a senior commander, you just need to figure out who stands to win or lose, whether you do this or not. Pin the tail on the donkey. Not hard, right? There's going to be five candidates for this. Take your pick, <laughs> right? The problem is going to be you're, you need to create a sense of unease that this F-35 will not be in service. You can draw on the 2018 games that you ran. There was another one, too, that was ran later that also something didn't work. There was an, I don't think it was the Pacific. There was another one. I heard General Minihan talk about this. So there was two of them, right? I, don't, I forget what the second one was. I just remember thinking, crap, that's a problem, right? Um, so the consumer reports thing or something that would come out, I think would be very valuable. And then the issue becomes as his commanding leader, then you can, then I would give them a way to redress the issue. Is this making sense to you? So redressing the issue would be you lean on the supplier or you lean on acquisition and you basically get more favorable terms or you find an alternative supplier or in negotiation because of their failure rate, you allow something else, someone else to do additive manufacturing. Because we're not talking about Coca-Cola here. We're talking about if you can't do this right, people die in the service of their nation, which is the ultimate thing we don't want to have happen. Okay, I'm going to let you have, ask, ask me questions. I didn't mean to talk this long, and I hope I'm not driving you into this solution. I'm just saying there's something about predictive decision-making that looks very powerful to me as opposed to trying to get a part that a manufacturer has, you have no leverage to get it out of them. So I'm going to take questions from you now. Right. And Audrey, am I speaking on behalf of all of us when I say that this just completely shifts how we look at the problem? Pivot, right? Yeah, I, I think so, Audrey. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think the good thing is, is that right now we probably have more questions for ourselves. Um, but I, I think that Brett would also like to ask a question. Sir, we can't hear you. Jeff, Maybe it's just my sound. Jeff, no, no, Jeff, you're muted. We, sorry, we couldn't. We couldn't hear you. There we go. So don't don't focus on my solution. That's a bad idea. My solution is going to be wrong. Just we erase that. I'm trying to model how I, how I would think through things. What what I do want you to focus on and what looks like a dead end to me. So what, what I'm trying to do is accelerate. You're probably not going to be able to change contractual agreements with a prime, right? Mm -hmm. And the primes have all kinds of intellectual property agreements around parts, right? You can't change that, right? What you can do is put a spotlight on who's failing here. And you can put a spotlight on who's likely to be a problem. And then you can connect it to somebody who has a chance to redress that, right? To say, either through policy or a, or a separate track, I can handle this. So in a sense, Misha, what I'm asking you to think about is somebody, you're not powerful enough to do this work to change a supply chain, but somebody else is. 
And what you're trying to do in being predictive with predictive analytics, you're trying to, so the key here is not the predictive analytics because that's just project management. You're trying to put pressure on the system to correct it. And so what I'm, what I'm, I'm swagging here, I'm spitballing, uh, 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 Audrey here, I'm just spitballing. Something that makes this not technical engineering garbage, you know, because they're going to show you the sheet and it's going to be uh, cycle babble and contract babble. I'm saying something is simple. And again, I'm I'm an old guy. Young people don't read consumer reports. They do things by they compare data. They do, you know, peer review, whatever. But I'm saying to me, something as simple as it's a red dot or a black dot or somewhere in between would tell a commanding, would be good for a commanding officer. You should know commanding officers are not going to read. You're going to provide a 50-page thing, and a commanding officer is going to give it to a tasker, who's going to give it to another tasker, right? And they're going to make the red dot or green dot or however that commanding officer wants to see it, just like a CEO. CEO is not going to read, you know, the, the KPMG, you know, quarterly report. They're not going to read it. They're going to ask somebody on their staff to provide one what's called the tear sheet what are the key things and what they're going to do is they're going to manage exceptions now this is important pete misha misha i want you to understand this last piece that i said managing things like supply chain is typically you want to keep things in standard variances that's not how you manage supply chain you manage exceptions meaning you manage the part of the supply chain that's in crisis and you manage the other tail of the bell curve that's like exceptional. And what you do is you address directly where you have a crisis because that's going to that's going to defeat the mission. And the part where you're exceptional, you search and reapply those best practices to other manufacturers. This makes sense how your muscles get bigger. It's how everybody plays better. Anything that's kind of, you know, like a red dot with a circle in it that's in spec, ignore it. It's not worth doing any. It doesn't require action. The problem with the military is you spend all your time in the middle of this. That's why it all turns into project management. Manage the edges. Is this making sense? Predict mm -hmm. the edges. Something's going to fail or something's doing way better than other people thought it would do. Anybody see the financial report today from the World Bank? Anybody see it? The U.S. economy is keeping the world afloat. The U.S. economy's numbers are as high as they've been since 1968. They're stunningly high, right? The problem is what? The problem is we're putting all of our attention. <laughs> our attention is not on the cumulative bell curve, right? Innovation, you, add, you look at the edges, the regular economy, you look at the middle, what we're doing is our innovations, we're looking at the middle and the regular economy, we're looking at the edges, which is backwards. You got to look the other way around. So you got to know what you're looking at and how to look at it. So I would be, I would find a couple owners of this. I would find a couple owners for this and I would spend a lot of time. I would spend a lot of time looking at how they like to look at the numbers. So it's me, you know, my red dot, black dot is kind of goofy Jeff stuff. Look at how they want to look at it and do it that way and call it, call it, give it their name. It's like the Eisenhower grid. You know, we still call it the Eisenhower grid. Because <laughs> Eisenhower looked at it that way. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, jet, senior officers in the military have looked at it that way for hundreds of years. But Eisenhower looked at it that way. Okay, <laughs> you get the point. <laughs> Other questions for me. I like Eisenhower too, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm hating on Eisenhower. I don't think this requires. Can I add one other thing, Audrey? That, I, that you're going to need to help them with. Simplify this. I've thrown a lot of stuff out. You need to find the center of this, and simplify. Greatly simplify it. The good thing is that we are progressing with that, but you're right, is that this is such a massive scope. And then how do we drill that down into something that can be actionable? One aircraft, I think you're right on it. I want to really congratulate you. I think the F-35, 
the Pacific, pick five things on the F-35 that most people aren't looking at. You don't want to look at munitions or kinetic stuff. Look at, you know, landing gear or some chip that typically goes awry on navigation or something. Because it's, you know, if you look at the design of the thing, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert at aircraft, but I can just tell you that the thing has so many chips on it that that's got to be a huge issue, right? It's got to be an enormous issue. You know, do you, you know, how do you swap out a chipset? And chips are not things that are easily, they're fussy. They're not interchangeable. Ugh. Right. Which I think a lot of the parts aren't here, right? Yeah, that's the other, other part, part about, it. well, you know, for example, if I can't change the supply chain, can I, can I create stage gating areas where, you know, think about the NVIDIA chips right now that are insane. You know, well, I'm, you know what's happening right now. What's going on in NVIDIA chips? Intel's being destroyed. NVIDIA is now gone through the roof. They think it's going to be $3 trillion. And the new Tesla has three times as many NVIDIA chips as it did in the last model. So where we're all going is kind of where people like me, my age, when computing started in the 70s, which was too many moving parts. So what will happen eventually is we'll have some standards we don't right now. We'll have some chips that get some chips that can do the work of chips that failed, but we don't have them yet. Is this making sense? So that what you're going to get is kind of a generic chip that can go into chipsets everywhere. It's a temporary generic chip. It can't do all the things the chip does, but it does 80% of it because that's the way chips work. Again, I don't want to get technical here, but that's basically where this is going to go. It's not there right now. So one thing you could do is to say there are five basic categories of chipsets, right? And here's where we need to we need to buy an extra one third of them, like when you take batteries on your trip, extra batteries because you know you're going to need one. And here's our in. in but you're not buying them for everything. So, you know, I'd look at like land, something mechanical that's going to fail, something electronic that's going to fail, something in a chipset that's going to fail. You also pick a dorky one, like a windshield or something. You know, there's got to be like some small, stupid piece of glass that's not the main windshield. It's going to be in some weird place and it has a tendency to fail all the time. I give, but give, let me give you one of my favorite examples. I did a thing with um, Marianne Miller, Colonel Miller, uh, uh, General Miller, who retired. One of the things that was stunning to me is that your aircraft that drop off heavy equipment have a rail down the middle. What was interesting was about 30% of the time when you send heavy stuff up the back, the rail bends. And it costs $180,000 to fix the rail, right? And you can't fix it yourself because Boeing or whoever, McDonnell Douglas, whoever had, whoever, it's not McDonnell Douglas, but whoever it is, though, don't, doesn't let you do it. So what one of the airmen did was they went to a fabrication factory and they built this big heavy cast iron, not cast iron, uh, heavy stainless steel piece of metal that you put on it and it rectified the bend in the back of the plane. <laughs> Meaning it's not, a, it's not a permanent piece of equipment, so they don't have to check with the vendor for this, right? It's just a piece you put on when you send things down. And what it did was, I think they, and I think that they cost like, and I'm not, I don't think I was exaggerating. It was like $20 to have them fashioned out, right? That to me sounds like the kind of thing we're talking about, right? 20 bucks, 180,000 bucks versus 20 bucks. Now, don't get me wrong. Once the 20 buck thing works, a lot of times, you know how this will go. There'll be some lawyer who will figure something out. And there'll be some congressman somewhere who, you know, decide to ruin the ride. They always do, unfortunately, sadly. But the truth of the matter is, I think there's really something here. Okay. Anything else before I let you go? Now, you were going to say a comment, Brett, and I think I cut you off. No, sir. I was just saying it's a lot to digest. Yeah, that's an unfortunate uh, side effect of talking to old professors who are, who are very <laughs> interested in your subject matter. Because I, I actually think what you're working on is really cool. I just want to make sure, and Misha, I'm sorry if I'm making you uncomfortable. I want to move this away from project management. And I want no, to I, I think you're so sweet, sir. I don't know what to say. <laughs> just want to move this into do that so we get those innovation muscles going. Is there anything else I can help you with? You guys 
keep going forward, right? Get momentum, keep going forward, but find the center of this thing. Find the simple, help them simplify, Aubrey. Help them simplify, 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 simplify. Have a good one, guys. Thank you. Yes, sir. Wow. So are we in our, in our room alone? Um, we are right now. Now we are, but this room is accessible to whoever the next team is. You guys want to yes. hop onto the team, our team chat? We can. Yeah, let's do that. Can you guys give me a minute? Yep. Okay. I will be right there. Thank you. All right.